Hey, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. We've all looked at code like this. We've all likely written code like this. I know I have, where we have this place order method. Where we're receiving an order to a database. Then we're using a payment gateway to process a credit card. And all that is wrapped in a try catch so that if there's a task canceled exception because of a timeout, then we cancel our order. If it's worked so far, then we also need to try and send out an email confirmation. And that is also wrapped in a try catch so we can swallow or just log if the exception happens because we don't want this whole method to blow up and throw an exception because we actually save the order and we process the credit card. There's a lot going on here. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, there's no separation of concerns or single responsibility. Sure, that's all valid. But that's actually not the crux of the issue when most people bring up these types of situations. And developers ask me a lot how to manage all this complexity. Before I give you the answer to that, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. EventStoreDB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. The real issue is that we have a business process or some complex workflow that branches in different ways that we need to manage, and there's going to be failures along the way. So we place an order, we process a payment, email confirmation. Okay, great, happy path, this is all good. But those try catches are indicating, well, it's not all good, and we want to deal with these in isolation. And there's kind of some type of workflow. There's a life cycle to this. So the issue here is that we place an order, we go to process our payment, and that fails. Then we have some branching logic that says, okay, well, now we cancel that order. We want to send out a cancel uh, email notification or do something else. We have a business process, we have workflows, and we need to manage that workflow in some meaningful way. Unfortunately, a lot of these business processes and workflows end up like my illustration, which is this long procedural code, or even if it's separated by methods, functions, classes, etc., it still has the same underlying problem is that everything needs to work during that request because it's all in process. There's these various steps, but they all need to be handled. If this fails, then I need to do this, and all of that has to work. So sure, we want separation of concerns. We want each one of these parts of the process to be broken up and isolated, but we also want them to be executed in isolation. Right now, you're thinking of it, it's all just in a single process when we're executing top to bottom. Even if these are in separate methods, function classes, they're all going together. Ultimately, what we want to do is we want to turn this so each is running independently and can deal with failures independently. So when I get to ask the question, okay, great, I want all this isolation. That sounds great. That's what I need. But how do I go about doing this? Use tooling. There's a lot of tooling that supports fundamentally these ideas. If you're in the .NET space, you can check out a lot of the great messaging libraries that we have and Service Bus, Mass Transit, Wolverine, Brighter, Rebus, there's a bunch of these things that support messaging and ways to deal with these workflows. So I'm going to show that as well as if you're not in the .NET space, you look you can look at platforms, things like temporal.io have different SDKs for different languages that are built on these ideas of building workflows. So here's an illustration of using NService Bus and one of their sagas in C Sharp. If you're not using .NET, that's totally cool. This will still give you a general idea. I won't get into the nitty gritty of it, but when you see in your own platform, you might see some similarities here. So we have a saga and the idea is that saga is going to maintain state for us. And then I have a message a place order that's actually going to kick everything off. We also have different messages that we're handling process uh, payment, the email confirmation, and we're actually going to handle a timeout. If something's taking too long, we're just gonna actually going to cancel the order. So the idea here is that for each different type of message, I'm going to handle that message, do something with it, and then kick off the next message. So when we're placing our order, I could be saving this to our database at that point. I'm actually setting a timeout here saying, okay, after a period of time for test purposes, I have five seconds, but this could be like a day, two days in the real world. So I'm setting some timeout that if nothing goes as planned, maybe you want to do something, we're going to cancel the order. Otherwise, what I'm trying to do now is I'm going to try to process the payment. When I send this, I'm just sending a message. After that, it's done. Asynchronously, we're going to be doing this up separate in another process potentially. Everything is uh, temporally decoupled. So then when I process our payment, same type of thing, I'm gonna say, okay, we've processed the payment, just logging. Now I say, okay, we've done that. Now I wanna send out the email confirmation. Separately, asynchronously, potentially in a completely different process, I can handle sending out that email. Once we've done that, I can mark my entire saga as complete. 
But the idea here is that you can see these methods are all together. They don't have to be. That's why I was kind of getting the point of separation. It's just the, the crux of this is that everything is executing independently. And the reason that matters so much is because of failures. Our first part, we saved our order to our database. That worked fine. Then the next step of this was actually processing that payment. Let's say our payment gateway was unavailable, timing out, etc. That's fine, we'll retry. Oftentimes these tools have built-in retry mechanisms, how you wanna configure that. But our order, it's there in our database. We may retry after five minutes, some back off, then retry again. And guess what? The payment gateway, everything's fine. It worked. The next part of the process kicks off, sending our email confirmation. So the idea here is that failures and how you wanna handle that failures is kinda of handled by you a little bit better than you'd be writing code yourself. Everything's executing independently. You have a lot more ways of dealing with failures if something happens along that long running business process. And it's also really important to mention bugs. Nobody writes bugs, right? But the thing is, is that if you have one part of that code where there is a bug, let's say there's some type of issue that you have, there's a failure because of a bug in your code where it can actually process the email and send out that email. You fix the bug, you deploy it, that task, that particular section of the workflow re-executes successfully, you keep moving on. You can also check out something like Temporal, which does exactly this. You can create different workflows. So I just downloaded one of their sample, changed it around a bit. So here's defining a workflow. This is their .NET SDK. And I'm just creating different types of workflows where, okay, I'm saying that I wanna place my order. That's an activity. That's kind of like a building block of a workflow. Then I'm saying, okay, after that, I wanna actually process the payment. After that, I'm gonna email the confirmation. So we have all these different activities that I've defined here. So we can see here's my place order activity, my process payment activity, my email confirmation. And guess what? All of these will be executed independently. It's using cues behind the scenes, messaging, but it's the same type of idea. Everything's running separate, even though in code, when you're looking at it, you think it's very procedural. It's not, however. And quickly, just to illustrate this, I'm gonna have two processes running. Right now I'm running the worker, which is actually gonna execute the workflows. And then I'm gonna have this separate uh, console here that I'm just gonna say to start the workflow. So this is basically just starting the workflow. Now you'll be able to see, okay, my place order ID, I was outputting that, that's just that GUID, processing the payment and emailing uh, the confirmation, now my workflow is complete. But each one of those activities, one of those tasks, one of those steps was executed independently. So if you're in a code base that's a hot mess of complexity because of these long running business processes, or you're about to start writing your own, don't go down that road of writing all this complex code of handling all these failures, all these different branches. Look to some tooling that handles workflow for you. Business processes are everywhere. That's often what you're writing. There's transitions from life cycles of these different business processes and workflows. Look to some tooling to help you along the way that provide a lot of the benefits. Like I said, the biggest one for handling this isolation, but a lot of the developer experience too on how you're writing this code and how it feels. Uh, some tools are better than others. So really kind of navigate them. Don't just jump into one. Really take a good look at the landscape and what there is in the platform that you're using. And absolutely, let me know in the comments so everybody else can read the tooling that you're using for these workflows. Are you using Temporal? Are you using something else? Are you using a messaging library? Let people know in the comments so they can gauge and look at the solutions that are out there. And if you wanna to talk to other developers about topics like this in domain-driven design, CQRS, event sourcing, all kinds of topics like this around software architecture and design, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. Check the link in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.